on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm delighted to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, before I introduce the, the panel, I just want to set the stage a little bit. I think all of us have been following the news reports uh, that have been coming over the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, beginning on April 25th when a 7.8 earthquake shook uh, the mountain nation of Nepal. Um, in uh, an area between Kathmandu and Pokhara. Um, and a second powerful 7.3 earthquake struck just yesterday, uh, causing more deaths and further complicating the recovery efforts. The first earthquake was uh, estimated to affect more than 8 million people, uh, with almost 8,000 killed and more than 16,000 injured. The preliminary data indicate that there were about 200,000 private houses destroyed uh, in some of the worst his districts and another 186,000 homes that were damaged um, and many of those were affected in the second earthquake. Um, the earthquake has also damaged about 5,000 community schools with 90% of the schools completely destroyed in the most highly affected districts. And the uh, early estimates of what it would take in terms of recovery from this earthquake uh, the series of uh, earthquakes uh, of, uh, are now coming uh, in the neighborhood of 10 billion U.S. dollars or above. So we're looking at something as a, an extraordinary magnitude for an impoverished uh, country like Nepal. Um, I should uh, mention that uh, the Asia Foundation has been active in Nepal since the 1990s, and we have a staff of about 40 people that are working there right now. Uh, fortunately, all of them uh, are safe, although several of them have lost their homes. And while the Asia Foundation does not have a major program focused on disaster relief or recovery, uh, we've jumped into the breach, uh, and uh, over the last couple of weeks, have been working with now about 39 of our local NGO partners uh, and providing, helping them provide basic uh, shelter, sanitation kits, and food to about 18,000 individuals in some of the most hard hit districts of Nepal. So let me take a moment to introduce our panel. Uh, we're really blessed and fortunate to have an extraordinary group uh, here tonight um, who bring a variety of different uh, perspectives and experience to the topic uh, that we're going to be discussing. Uh, let me begin, begin uh, in the middle with Dr. Elizabeth Hausler, who's the founder and the CEO of Build Change, which is an international nonprofit which designs earthquake-resistant houses and also trains builders, homeowners, engineers, and government officials to build safer housing and schools. She is a civil engineer by training um, and uh, also had the distinction of serving as a Fulbright Scholar in 2002 where she um, was studying post-earthquake reconstruction in Gujarat, India. So she knows the neighborhood and she has colleagues who are on the ground and her background and the work of her organization are obviously directly relevant to the topic uh, that we're discussing tonight. Uh, to uh, Elizabeth's left is uh, Berger Stomperdahl. Uh, and Berger is the president and CEO of Give to Asia, an organization that is working in 25 countries across Asia to fund charitable projects and social enterprises <clears throat> and also to aid in disaster response effort. <clears throat> in the spirit of full disclosure, I should mention that the Asia Foundation uh, had a hand in giving birth to Give to Asia. Which, uh, <coughs> we're very proud of our offspring. Uh, it's an organization that is now helping to channel philanthropic resources to very worthwhile projects and worthy organizations throughout Asia, including in Nepal. To my immediate left is Norbu Tenzing, who is the vice president of the American Himalayan Foundation, uh, and his organization supports education, health care, uh, cultural and environmental preservation throughout the Himalayan region. Uh, he's been with uh, the uh, American Himalayan, uh, Himalayan Foundation since 1993. And uh, I think one of the more interesting aspects of his background is that he happens to be the son of the illustrious Sherpa uh, Ten Tenzing Norgay, who uh, made the pioneering climb of Mount Everest 
more than 50 years ago, in fight 1953, uh, along with Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, and uh, there's a, now a large statue to your father uh, in, uh, in uh, Nepal. So I'm going to start, if I may, with uh, Elizabeth. Um, and I want to uh, ask you to say a little bit about what you see as kind of the physical and infrastructure challenges that, are, that we're going to face as, as we tackle the rebuilding uh, process. Uh, what kind of help is Nepal going to need uh, to, to do this uh, well? Uh, and what kind of a role is your organization uh, going to be playing in this process? That's a, a great question. Um, well, there's something like 500,000 houses that are destroyed or damaged, as you mentioned. And so just the, simply this massive need is, is, is going to create challenges in terms of logistics and, and, and access to building materials and that sort of thing. But I think there's also a real opportunity here because for many of the rural homes that collapse, these are unreinforced stone masonry buildings. Um, and there are some small changes that could be made to these buildings to improve the way they perform in the next earthquake at fairly low cost. Things like using a cement-based mortar and um, putting a, a ring beam on top, top of the walls. There's some very simple changes that could be made to these buildings to make them safe. And so the challenge is getting this information in the hands of the people who can really make that happen building the capacity of local professionals, local builders, local engineers, working with the homeowners so that they're really engaged in this process and they're making the decisions about what to do with their house and houses and making sure that the aid money that is available for housing is used in a way that encourages or incentivizes building safely. And this is something that has been, has been done consistently in, in recent disasters and has produced a good result. The other opportunity I think here is that looking at the number of people killed, of course this was an incredible tragedy, but I think the death toll could have been a lot higher. And I think there are some lessons that could be very positive coming out of Nepal in terms of some buildings, maybe newer buildings um, that were designed more recently according to um, more modern codes actually performed well. And so I think there's an opportunity to turn this into a positive message as the engineering studies come out and we see that some of the buildings actually performed well. There have been investments in Nepal in building earthquake resistant buildings. And I think it could be a, an opportunity for the rest of the world to, to, to see that that investment might pay off. So what Build Change is doing Initially, we're visiting buildings and understanding why they collapsed and, and how to build them better. And we're also going to be building capacity of local engineers. This is something that Build Change does at scale around the world. We're operating in six countries now. Um, because those are the people that are really going to create change in the long term. And we're going to be working with the NGO and the donor community so that they can leverage their resources and use it as an incentive to build safely. Great. Berger, what's the response been from the international donor community to this uh, incredible uh, tragedy? And what, what patterns do you see uh, emerging from your work with give to asia Sure. Um, so uh, the, the response so far from the donor community, the international donor community, has been quite strong given the uh, sort of the typical giving patterns, I think, of, of donors. Um, and in particular, Givtasia works with sort of a mix of corporate donors and foundations and individual donors. Um, and we tend to see um, a lot of the, the giving going to places, especially for corporations where there are markets. Um, and in the case of <coughs> Nepal, um, there's been a lot of, of, of corporate giving as well as giving from foundations and individuals, uh, which I think is really great to see. And so I think the 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 that response has been very strong. I think one of the big challenges that we're we're seeing with um, with this particular disaster is then getting the aid to where it's needed because a lot of the those people who are affected are in very rural areas and and uh, Nepal is is difficult. Uh, those rural communities are difficult to get the aid to. But I think that the for the initial relief, the the response has been strong in terms of providing resources to the, the groups that are delivering aid or trying to deliver the aid. Um, 
our you know, Give to Asia's um, focus is a bit more on the longer term recovery. So we're not a relief organization when it comes to disaster. We've, we've responded to 40 disasters in the past 10 years or so, at large and small, in, in the Asia Pacific region. And, um, as, and, and we are working with local organizations on the ground that uh, tend to be more focused on the longer term recovery, although we are have already f done some funding specifically in the area of relief. Um, but one of the challenges um, is that there's a lot of, um, and one of the trends in general with disasters like this is that there's a lot of need um, in the long term. Um, and, you know, in the months and even a couple of years after a disaster to rebuild homes, to really br get things back on track after the immediate relief needs, um, that after that stage has sort of passed with a disaster. But really, this is the fundraising stage because this is the time that people are giving. Um, and so that's, that's a general challenge in terms of the philanthropic response and the donor response that, that we've seen over time that I'm certain we'll see again with this. Norbu, uh, your foundation uh, does incredible work on the ground in remote uh, areas and villages with Sherpas, with Tibetans, uh, and other uh, Nepalis. You yourself have just returned from Nepal. What, uh, what are some of the challenges and what are the, the hurdles that you see in terms of the recovery process and, and ultimately the ability for Nepal to rebuild? Well, um, first, um, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I used to be introduced as uh, Tenzing's son. And my brother climbed Everest, now I'm Jamling's brother. So, <laughs> um, but I was in Nepal uh, two days after the, the, the earthquake, and um, you know, you're just shell-shocked to see the extent of the damage, the loss of life, the buildings. Um, and um, since then, uh, you know, I've been keeping up with uh, news and talking to people. Uh, throughout this whole time, and in the immediate uh, aftermath, um, you know, we set up a, a relief fund, and so people have been very generous uh, uh, towards contributing towards it, and our, um, I think the challenge that we face right now, we, in the immediate aftermath, was to get water, um, um, food, shelter, those things have slowly uh, been getting to um, folks around uh, the valley itself, but up in the mountains, it's been really hard. Uh, just in the last couple of days, um, you know, helicopter, uh, hel helicopters have been dropping supplies up in the Everest area, uh, up in the Tibet, towards the Tibetan border. Uh, we have a number of projects where nuns have been stranded with absolutely no food, no water, no shelter for the past two weeks. Uh, so I think in the uh, short term, we're still in the short term right now, there's still issues with delivery. Um, the government has uh, uh, initially uh, put some barriers for supplies coming in, but that's all. Uh, those barriers have been removed. They've made it really easy for um, uh, supplies to come in. Uh, I, I have to, this, the role of social media in this country especially, there's a large expat Nepali community in the Bay Area around uh, this country, uh, and everybody's been really active, and I think um, those individuals are making a significant impact on uh, delivering things directly and immediately. Let me turn to what may be less immediately visible aspects of, of, of this disaster and the recovery process. Uh, two in particular. One is kind of the class dimensions in terms of uh, the poorest being the most vulnerable and the most hard hit and most uh, directly and adversely affected. And, and second is the gender dimension uh, of, of this. Uh, the UN's estimated there are about 3.2 million women uh, that are, have been affected by uh, the, this, this earthquake. Uh, many of them are sole breadwinners uh, or single-headed uh, uh, households. Um, looking at the maternal and child health care uh, dimension of this, but also the increased risk now of gender-based violence among uh, women who are uh, homeless and, uh, and in internally displaced. Uh, uh, Norbu, can we ask you to comment a little bit on how this plays out in, uh, in, in uh, kind of social terms uh, within uh, Nepali society? Well, there's a large number of young Nepalis who have absolutely no other option but to go overseas, especially to the Middle East. Um, and so when this disaster happened in these villages where a lot of these people died, uh, there were very few men or none around. 
and some of them are trying to come home, you know, for the funerals of their families. Some of them just can't come back because, uh, you know, they're chained to their jobs in the Middle East. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a large, the, the, the Nepal is a predominantly a male-dominated society, but in, in the situations where we have these earthquakes, it's really important to have uh, men around, and large numbers of them are, are, are out, uh, you know, uh, are working. Uh, the other issue I've read, um, uh, since we have a program that helps um, put some 10,000 girls at risk through school, we're finding um, that uh, there is inc increased risk of young girls being trafficked from Nepal to um, India and other parts of the world. Uh, how much of that is true, I don't, but those who uh, are vulnerable have become just more vulnerable right now. So. Um, Elizabeth, your organization works in six countries. Uh, you've been involved in other uh, you know, uh, earthquake uh, recovery efforts. Are there lessons from China or from Haiti or for other places that you've worked that, uh, in your view, would have particular relevance to the rebuilding effort in Nepal? Sure, and, and just picking up on the, the gender issue, w we have found when we work with um, female head of households especially, and we engage them in the decision-making process of how they want to rebuild their house, they tend to prioritize safety and rebuilding a safe house um, more often than their male counterparts. And so <laughs> there is, so there's, again, the, there's some statistics about women and, and, and children being 14 times more negatively affected by disasters than men. And this is really, you know, really awful. But there's also, I think, again, this huge opportunity to engage women in the rebuilding of their homes. And if we have seen time and again, when we're able to do that, we, we have a, a stronger, safer house. And you know, women can build houses too. So I, um, I grew up outside of Chicago. My dad owns a masonry construction company, and so he taught me how to lay bricks. <laughs> and so we, um, we train women in the construction sector where it's appropriate. In Haiti, we have women builders. In Indonesia, we have women brick makers. In Philippines, women are, better welders than men from what I hear. So, so we have to find how we can really engage women in this process of reconstruction. And I think we've seen time and again after every disaster that Build Change has worked in when we're able to do that at every level from hiring women engineers, women architects, to enabling women to make decisions, then it really has a positive result. So I think another lesson is, you know, following on that, basically putting the power in the hands of the people. And instead of just going in and giving someone a house, instead of going in and building something for someone and giving it away. Um, enabling homeowners to make their own decisions using, using a cash plus technical assistance approach. And really the, the relief and development, the post-disaster industry, the NGOs that build houses after disasters has really changed over the last 10 years. And they have really shifted toward this, appro uh, toward this approach of not just giving away a house, but enabling people to make their own decisions using, using cash plus technical assistance. And when I say cash plus technical assistance, I'm talking about using cash as an incentive to enforce building code compliance. And really that's what we're doing here is, is basically taking the first step toward encouraging people to rebuild safely. So if we can use those lessons that we've learned in how to roll this out at scale, how to use tablets to collect data, how to, how to give the money out in installments so it actually really works, all these lessons that we've learned in other disasters and bring them um, into um, the reality in Nepal, I think we're gonna have a much uh, more cost-effective and satisfactory reconstruction than we've seen in some of the other occasions. Great. Berger, um, advice to donors. What, what would you advise in terms of how people should, uh, you know, make sure that their, uh, their contributions are going to be well used? How do sure. you think about this balance between immediate short-term relief versus longer-term recovery? Um, and, you know, what, what sort of words of wisdom for those that want to help Mm -hmm. but also want to make sure that their uh, contributions are going to reach the right people in the right places. Sure. How, how do they do that? 
besides giving it to give to Asia. Well, that was my fir the first <laughs> thing I was going to say. Um, the, um, you know, I think that there's a, I think there's a really low expectation right now in some cases um, with, with, with donors to really un understand and see the impact of what they're doing and what they're giving. And in, in, and in some ways, I think, um, you know, there, there's a lot of need and there's a lot that the, the work that relief organizations are doing, um, uh, it's critical work and, and groups, there, there are relief organizations with incredible logistics capability to come in right now and help. But I think that there, there are also donors who really want to understand what, what they're, you know, what they're funding and, and, and I, th and I think that, um, there's, there are a lot of groups out there who can, um, you, who, who can be, there are a lot of groups out there who are quite accountable to donors about for the for the for the the funding that they're doing and the work that they're doing, so that the the donor community can get a sense of of what they've funded and see the impact. And I think that hold then holds those organizations that are doing the work accountable as well. Um, so I would encourage donors to look for that level of accountability and that level of reporting back. Um, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think there is a, a huge amount of need in the recovery, not just in the relief. And I think everything we're talking about right, you know, in this last round of questions is really about the recovery and they're really critical. And it's, um, it's, um, it's uh, an area that I think gets overlooked in the, in the sort of the process of responding to these disasters. And so I would encourage, uh, you know, donors who have the ability to sort of hold on and wait and then make some intelligent decisions about funding programs a little bit later on when the recovery process happens. I think, uh, you know, if they have the ability to do that, I would encourage it. Okay. I feel like, can I give him sure. a round Piggyback. of applause for that? <laughs> 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 That's great. <laughs> about rebuilding, right? About, <laughs> about, well, about, about holding on to some funding until, until later stages. I mean, we, we saw this in Haiti. The NGO com and donor community came in and spent a lot of money on transitional shelter. And they created an expectation that they would come back in five years and then build everyone a permanent house. Well, that did not happen because there was less money available really when it came down to it. And so now, I was just in Haiti a couple months ago in February and looking at some of these five-year-old temporary houses and they're really in rough shape now. And there's, where is the resource now? Where is the resource to work with these folks to build <coughs> a permanent house? And so again, these are the kind of lessons that we can draw from, from other disasters and how to most effectively use the aid money that's mm -hmm. there for the biggest impact. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I all, I'd, I'd just like to add that um, you know, to what you said, that as a small organization, like the American Himalayan Foundation, for example, we're able to collect the funds immediately from individuals. We're able to deploy the funds immediately on the ground. In the last two weeks, we've been able to provide sanitation uh, supplies. We've been able to provide water. We've been able to provide um, food. Um, anything that's immediate, any, anything they need right now, we're able to sort of say, uh, to provide the services right away. So. Um, I think you can hold funding for uh, medium-term and long-term relief, but uh, uh, you know, while people are interested, uh, while people can give, I think people should be generous and uh, uh, not say no to money. <laughs> the other um, recommendation would be to look for areas that are not that are getting missed. Um, you know, there's a there's um, there there are needs in the recovery period that often don't get funded, um, like. Um, psychosocial and sort of P PTSD um, for for a lot of people who were affected by this disaster, and that's that's um, very underfunded, I think, typically, and with disasters and um, and some of the topics we were talking earlier really are related to livelihood and economic empowerment and um, and strengthening the economy of those communities that were affected, and I think that that often also gets underfunded. So just uh, just another piece to think about. Um, Norbu, I want to uh, ask your views on uh, what it might be called the political or governance dimensions of the response. The, uh, the, you know, earthquakes have happened in Nepal before. Uh, there's been disaster planning uh, as an ongoing uh, activity. Uh, and yet the interior minister was quoted as saying, we were not prepared for a disaster of this scale. We do not have enough resources and will need more time to reach out to everyone. Um, 
you've been there, you've seen uh, the process on the ground. Uh, what's your assessment of how the government uh, has performed in terms of uh, the immediate post-earthquake uh, phase? No, I think um, especially the government of uh, Nepal is a very easy scapegoat, uh, you know, under these, uh, under any circumstances. But uh, if a disaster of this scale had happened in this country, you know, people in the most developed country would not be as prepared. Uh, this was an unimaginable disaster. People did the best they could. Uh, the government, I think, responded um, quite fast to uh, um, issues with uh, aid uh, coming in um, with, uh, for, for, with foreign governments, mm -hmm. how funds can be distributed, uh, you know, uh, relieving some of the taxes on goods that were bring in, et cetera. So uh, they did take some flack for it, um, but, um, uh, and there is, I saw there's a quake meter the other day, some half a billion has been raised uh, through uh, bilateral and go government agencies and so on, but, um, I think right now, at least, uh, 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 people seem to be slowly getting the supplies that they need. Uh, the government is trying to trying their best, I think. Uh, um, and a lot of people tend to criticize the government, uh, but uh, and under these circumstances, uh, uh, I think we have to give them a little bit of a break. They're doing what they can, but uh, they're just counting on private individuals and anybody who can help. Um question here about uh, kind of the, the physical uh, barriers in terms of delivering aid. Uh, you know, obviously what we're able to see is mostly what transpired in Kathmandu, but getting out to the villages and getting aid out to the villages. Uh, you know, the, say a, a little bit about some of the, the physical uh, and transportation challenges uh, here. Are, how do we make sure that relief is actually reaching the people that need it desperately. I think in the immediate aftermath, what you all saw on CNN, BBC, was the incredible damage to historic structures in Kathmandu. Um, and frankly, going and walking around the city for the two days, the damage wasn't uh, sort of that exp as extensive as one would have uh, imagined. Um, but getting the, um, uh, to answer your question, uh, the supplies to the villages has been, uh, uh, there's, you know, there were only six helicopters, I think, in all of Nepal, uh, especially the government helicopters and the private helicopters were all busy bringing down, you know, climbers from the Everest uh, region. So um, relief supplies in the early, early, in the early stages was really, really hard. Um, just today I saw Indian helicopter landed up uh, in the Mount Everest area, delivering, finally delivering some tarps, some food. Uh, people have been, people are very resilient, uh, the uh, Nepalese people, including Sherpas and Tibetans. Uh, but one community that, that uh, has been affected uh, is the Tibetan community, uh, which the, of which there are some 25,000 in Nepal, and Tibetans really don't, uh, are not uh, part of the Nepali uh, population, I guess, even though many have lived there for, for a long time. So government aid is a little hard to come to for them in particular. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there's always some politics involved uh, with these issues. Um, but I think um, uh, aid is slowly starting to get there, and there's a heavy demand from what I see in the last week for uh, structural engineers <laughs> in Nepal. Uh, right. So I think... Uh, That's a wonderful lead-in for Elizabeth. Uh, and let me ask, uh, you know, what are, the, are, are there some simple techniques or low-cost uh, um, methods that, you, based on your experience, uh, you know, you would recommend be adopted as, as Nepal undertakes this massive rebuilding effort? Yeah, I, I, and just to pick up your point about the government's role, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I th we regularly are, are supporting governments in our work. We've got a partnership with the Haiti Ministry of Public Works. We're collaborating with the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines. I mean, we're really regularly collaborating with governments, and, and they're dealing with a very difficult a very, very difficult circumstance. And so the more that we can really support and build their capacity, the better off everyone, I think, is going to be. Um, and so picking up on that, looking at what small changes we could make to some e existing ways of building. I was talking earlier a little bit about the rural stone masonry, but there's also a lot of urban um, multi-story buildings, um, many of which did well in the earthquake. But there's one type of building 
in Kathmandu that um, that that had some pretty significant problems. And those are these buildings that have uh, soft stories, open ground floors. So multi-story buildings where the ground floor is a shop or a cafe or something like that. And the second and third story are apartments or something that's closed in. So you have a very heavy mass on top of a weak ground floor. And so the engineering community needs to get together and come up with better ways of building these buildings, which do not consist of blocking in the ground floor, because that's not really going to work. We have to recognize the use of these buildings and the architectural preferences and that sort of thing. So, but there is an engineering solution. It, it can be found. But what's interesting to me about this from a global perspective is that these buildings are all over the world. We've seen them collapse in other earthquakes around the world. This is a problem that we know about and we should be able to solve. And I'm sure most people in this room know about this soft story, retrofit ordinance in San Francisco. There are these buildings here. So again, there's, there are global lessons and global opportunities coming out of this event in Nepal. Um, I have a question here and it's directed uh, to you from a member of our audience and ask you to talk about the difference in, in uh, Nepal in the, in the wake of the earthquake versus experience uh, in the post-typhoon uh, areas like the Philippines. Uh, what are the similarities? What are the differences? What, what, what uh, um, uh, modifications in approach uh, are, are required as you're thinking earthquakes in Nepal versus typhoons in the Philippines? Yeah, the one big difference in terms of an immediate um, aftermath is, is with an earthquake, it's easier to recover building materials. With a tsunami or a storm surge, really things are wiped away, timber is ruined, that sort of thing. And so from tr strictly kind of a structural and material perspective, in an earthquake, you can actually recover a lot of building materials and rebuild more easily. In a tsunami or a, a storm surge, it's not, not that easy. Um, but the reality of the reconstruction is that there are rules that need to be followed regardless of whether we're rebuilding to withstand the next earthquake or the next windstorm. We call them, the th we, we talk about the three C's all the time, configuration, connections, and construction quality. And these can apply to a house, a school, a skyscraper, a bridge, um, a typhoon, an earthquake. Configuration, simple square, symmetric, don't put a heavy weight over your head on a weak wall <laughs> in an earthquake, it's just not gonna work. Um, and then Connections tie everything together properly. This is so essential for earthquakes as well as typhoons, windstorms, and construction quality, good quality materials, good workmanship, making sure we're building capacity of local professionals to produce all of those things. And so these lessons, you know, we've worked in Asia, Latin America, all over the world, and these lessons apply no matter what context we're in, in, in terms of enabling um, rebuilding in a way that's disaster resistant. I have uh, several questions about um, how people can contribute and help. Um, one has to do with the, how can money be sent to local areas in the absence of credit cards and a banking system? Um, and is it actually possible to send cash or distribute cash and how would that work? Uh, and this is in the context of immediate relief for food, water, medical supplies, et cetera. So that's one question. The second really relates to faith-based communities, religious communities and their response. And the question there is, uh, you know, given the predominantly Hindu and Buddhist uh, uh, makeup of the, the Nepali, uh, Nepalese population, how are aid efforts from uh, other uh, religions uh, both being viewed and how are they uh, being mobilized in this, uh, in this uh, disaster situation? Okay. Um, I'll have an easier time answering the first, I think, than the second. But um, the, um, you know, I, I think we we saw this in the in the in the Philippines as well. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of desire. There was a strong sort of uh, um, workforce presence outside of the Philippines. It's just like there's a, lo a lot of um, Nepalese. Um, um, uh, sort of the large part of the Nepalese workforce is, is overseas as well, and so. Um, 
you know, I, I guess my advice would be if, if, you're, if you want to support a local community um, and, and support what's going on in that community, there are ways to do that with, the, with, you know, with local organizations. And that's sort of what we, what we do as an organization, which is to help connect donors to local groups on the ground. Um, so those could be local schools, um, uh, it could be local um, local nonprofits that are already embedded in in the community. I, you know, I would suggest going that route as opposed to um, mailing cash only for purposes of accountability and making sure that the money is being spent the way you want to want it to, to see it spent in terms of having a, a positive impact on the affected community. Um, and it's 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 definitely possible to do that. Um, and the uh, um, you know the uh, the other um, the other question in terms of religious so religious organizations responding. Um, most of the response that I've seen so far has really been relief focused, and um, and I I'm not sure about the um, the donor community within those. I'm assuming that they're, they're that they're drawing donations from from uh, people within their religious community. But what I I haven't I would have tend to see in other in other disasters and what I assume is happening in this is that it's being distributed rather indiscriminately, um, not indiscriminately, but, 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 <laughs> but, discrimination. but without discrimination to, um, um, uh, to those who are in need. And, and so I think that they're, they're acting, um, you know, as, as relief organizations delivering aid to where it's needed and um, doing good work. Norbu, uh, you may want to comment on that second question as well, but, um, I also have a question here about the economic impact and the prospects for economic recovery uh, in Nepal. Uh, you know, the impact of uh, this kind of a disaster on uh, vital economic infrastructure, uh, you know, electricity, sewer, roads, airports, et cetera. Uh, the impact on herders and farmers that need to get, you know, their, their uh, products uh, to market tourism we've talked mm -hmm. about. Say a word, if you would, about uh, kind of what's the economic uh, picture and prognosis for Nepal's recovery. I think to uh, um, uh, expand on a little bit what you said, with uh, the Indian community has been, uh, and the Indian government has been really supportive and s sending aid uh, to Nepal. Uh, and. But on a people-to-people -people basis, um, you know, the, uh, the government of China provided a lot of aid, but uh, I don't think it played out that much in the media in China as it did in India. So India being a neighbor and also being a Hindu country, there I've seen a lot of um, help, direct financial food supplies coming in from India. Um, but to answer your, in, in a little country like Bhutan, for example, you know, uh, sent in a uh, million dollars and they sent in the best health professionals and doctors too. Um, help Nepal. Um, but as far as uh, the Nepalese economy goes, I'm not an economist, but remittances I think is big. And the other thing is tourism. Um, I spoke to about a dozen tour operators uh, while I was there and over here, uh, people on both ends, uh, everybody canceled their trips <coughs> to Nepal uh, for the rest of the year, um, partly out of respect not to use resources that would have to uh, would be used for tourists traveling to enjoy the mountains. So, um, but also um, uh, there wouldn't really uh, be much for them to see. And people on both ends took a very big hit. So I think Nepal needs a very, very big uh, push in, f in terms of tourism. You know, it's the most beautiful country uh, in the world. It has a superb, rich uh, cultural heritage and some wonderful sites over there. Uh, and those mountains will always be there, and I would really encourage uh, people to go back to Nepal, um, you know, starting this fall. Um, so tourism will come back, uh, but as far as the um, infrastructure goes with electricity and water, you know, those are things that uh, the government will have to, um, to uh, sort out, I guess. Um, Elizabeth, there's a question here about the role of volunteers in the build, building re-effort, and you've been involved in a number of places. Um, have you had experience with well-meaning volunteers, and how does your organization use them or counsel or coach other organizations to use uh, volunteer help in the rebuilding process? 
Yeah, we use volunteers on a very limited basis. And in fact, we don't really use volunteers at all for the actual construction. We don't, we don't build buildings ourselves. We're training everyone else to build them. And so we're, and we want to build local capacity. So we wouldn't bring in a volunteer to pound nails or to build a house if it would displace a local person from having the opportunity to earn income by doing that and to learn that skill. So we, we, we don't bring in volunteers that way. We, however, do use um, structural engineering volunteers. One of them is in our aud audience right now. Um, <laughs> so we've partnered with some of the structural engineering um, firms here, mostly in the Bay Area, to provide us with additional expertise and the kind of um, ability to do train the trainer programs. So we regularly bring in volunteer structural engineers who can then train local structural engineers to build their capacity so that they can go out and train the local builder and that sort of thing. Great. Mm -hmm. Berger, uh, give to asia is involved in uh, capacity building efforts across Asia in terms of disaster planning, disaster response, mm -hmm. trying to enhance the resilience. Um, what are the, the, the key lessons or insights uh, in, in terms of uh, not dealing with this disaster, but being in a better position for future disasters. Sure. Um, so yeah, we, we, Give to Asia has a, uh, we're in the middle of a, of a three-year program right now working with local communities um, in six countries, Philippines, um, Indonesia, um, let's see, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, um, Bangladesh, and India. Um, and so identifying some of the most at-risk communities there that that um, you know have probably been dealing with disaster for quite some time um, and really s sort of the first stage of what we were doing was listening to you know what have these local communities you know already figured out um, in terms of addressing um, um, you know w and, and adapting to the disaster risk that is sort of inherent to where they are um, um, and trying to push some of that learning up to networks and other groups um, um, uh, maybe f sort of further up the food chain so some of that learning can be shared um, with other communities dealing with similar risks. So I think w one thing I would say is um, to groups looking at preparedness is to, you know, do a lot of listening and, and understand what sort of, you know, what some of the, the, the practices already are in the, in the country or in the area where there's, where is there's, there's disaster. Um, and then I think the other piece that I would say is that w one of one disaster so prevalent, right? You know, in in Asia in particular, if you look at the number of huge disasters that have happened in 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 Asia, you know, in, in since the 2004 uh, tsunami, um, th I think there's been um, uh, the 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 earthquake in China in 2008, the Tohoku disaster in Yolanda, and this disaster in Nepal. There, um, and I think for groups that are funding local organizations or funding programs on an ongoing basis such as health and education in schools, I think um, there should be an eye toward or looking at um, disaster preparedness as sort of a, just an inherent part of what you do to help make organizations, local organizations sustainable so that they can um, uh, be, um, be prepared to uh, continue operating and, and be successful regardless of the disasters that, that, may, that may come in the future. Um, and I think that's something that we try to recommend as we're sort of looking at program strategies with some of the donors we work in is how can you work in some level of disaster preparedness in, in an ongoing manner in terms of what you're funding. And so that's, I don't think it happens all the time, but I, it's that's certainly something that I think um, I would recommend donors think about regardless of sort of where they're funding in the moment. Uh, Norbu, to say, uh, we've, we've touched on the, uh, the social psychological uh, aspects of, of this disaster. Um, the, the people of Nepal have been through two and a half, three weeks of shaking and rattling and uh, things falling uh, down, sleeping outside. Say a little bit about the, the, the psychology and, and the, the, uh, the kind of post-disaster um, stress levels uh, in, in Nepal based on your experience and, and your conversations with colleagues working there. Well, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the uh, Nepalese people are amazing, resilient um, folks, and um, uh, we've seen a lot of hardship uh, over the years. 
Um, I think uh, in the wake of what happened, you could um, see uh, people from all walks of life coming to help each other in Nepal, uh, knowing they're going to get back uh, on the feet. There was an amazing sense of calmness uh, in Kathmandu when I went, uh, amazing spirit of cooperation, uh, everybody helping each other, uh, you know, uh, especially the elderly. And so, um, you know, I think Nepal will persevere. Um, I've read some wonderful poems from young students saying that Nepal will rise. Uh, I've heard the same voice from older people who um, live in Nepal, and uh, they're just really uh, hopeful that uh, the spirit of the people will lift them uh, and bring them back to, uh, you know, um, where the country uh, has been. And, you know, uh, people are confident, and uh, the spirit of the, those uh, the Nepalese around the world has really been amazing. Um, everybody, everybody that I know has been um, desperate to help and do something that they can. Uh, people are going back in droves, you know, taking cash with them uh, to help their villages, to help their friends, uh, doctors, engineers, um, all kinds of people from here are just dropping everything they have and going back but just saying, if you really need me, I'll be there, but not to be a burden. Um, Elizabeth, can I just uh, ask a, a, a question that's been posed here, and that is, you know, how realistic is it, I mean, even with the construction techniques that you've described, for uh, to really be prepared for a disaster of, of this magnitude? And, uh, and you alluded earlier to the fact that, you know, some of the early evidence suggests that there, some buildings have survived better than others, but you know, uh, what, what's the, uh, the, the threshold here and, and how, how much uh, can taking advanced precautions and using better materials and safe, safer seismic uh, uh, construction, uh, you know, prevent this kind of uh, serious uh, catastrophe? Yeah, it can prevent it, absolutely. So we, we've been working in Indonesia since shortly after the Indian Ocean tsunami. In West Sumatra, there was an earthquake in 2007. We worked with people to rebuild houses after that earthquake. There was another earthquake in 2009, and none of the houses that met our minimum standards had any damage in this earthquake. And these are very simple timber frame buildings, confined masonry that were just a little bit better than what was there before, um, using a little bit more reinforcement, better workmanship, the three C's like I was talking about before, connections, construction quality, configuration. and so. And so it absolutely can be done. And there's a great, there's a great picture on National Geographic's website. Um, it came out a few days after the earthquake. It, it's titled something like 10 Pictures You Haven't Seen from Nepal. And it shows a village um, where on the left-hand side of the photo, you see a bunch of these collapsed, un unreinforced masonry older buildings. And on the right-hand side, there's a picture of what looks to be a fairly newly built stone masonry building with cement mortar. Um, better workmanship, a lightweight roof that looks like it's not damaged. And so the knowledge of how to build a disaster resistant building is in Nepal. The challenge is getting that knowledge into the hands of all these people who are going to be rebuilding. And the second challenge is financing it. And like I said before, making creating an environment in which that financing can be coupled with the knowledge and be used as an incentive for people to comply with the building standards and getting, getting the materials that are needed in order to build safely to these remote areas. Because, I mean, really, we are talking about cement and steel. We do need some more cement and steel <laughs> to make these buildings safe. Um, but it's possible, it's absolutely possible to do that. I mean, there, there should, the deaths, most of the deaths that happened in this earthquake are completely preventable. The avalanche deaths, not so much. But the deaths from building collapses are completely preventable. This is a man-made problem, and there's a man-made solution for this. So it can be done. Great. And I think it could have been worse if it happened at night. Mm -hmm. But the village you're talking about um, up in the Everest area, the pictures were taken by a friend of mine, and that happened to be my mother's village. And so some 90% of the homes over there, I mean, there are only 50 homes there, <laughs> but 90% uh, of the homes are completely destroyed. And that's the village that's starting to get some relief supplies right now. It's, you know, it was, you know, people say this was a class-based earthquake. Um, you know, the uh, people in the villages and the homes that weren't built that well uh, took a big hit. And um, 
and there were entire villages wiped out by this massive avalanche up in Langthang, for example. Um, but um, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that, that I did, uh, this friend of mine, uh, uh, David Morton actually took those pictures, and I spoke with him uh, uh, two days after Is that it happened. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I think I think um, <laughs> the uh, after the second shake, oh, no. <laughs> more of we'll it was go gone. Yeah, I have to go back and look at it. So. <laughs> Norbu, your your point, uh, you know, is uh, a great lead into a question from a member of the audience here, and that's uh, it says uh, that Nepal was already dealing with the challenges of poverty, of vulnerable populations, uh, not being able to access education, health care, uh, being trafficked, as you've talked about. The question is really, how, in what ways has the earthquake exacerbated these issues or, or created even a larger uh, a segment of uh, the population that, that's vulnerable to some of these uh, social issues? I think, if anything, the earthquake could probably bring, bring people about together in a way that the country has never come about. <laughs> and so, um, uh, in Nepal has gone through a lot, many of you know, in the last 20 years, through what happened with the royal family and the Maoists, uh, and then this unfortunate uh, 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 disaster, um, but you know the country will, I believe, come back uh, over time, and um, and you could never uh, discount the resilience and the spirit of the people, um, and that uh, is something that uh, I think will take us a long way. Do you see it contributing to some political coming together? We've been wrangling over the new constitution. Uh, you've had elections that were supposed to produce consensus on a new constitution. What possibility is there that in this great coming together that you've talked about at the popular level that we'll also see some uh, ability to overcome the stalemate in the political uh, picture? And that I have no comment on. <laughs> um, to stay out of uh, politics, but um, uh, all I can say is um, People are doing the best that they can. Uh, the government is, under these circumstances, um, trying as hard as they can. Um, but whether uh, this goes at the back of the minds in a couple of months, and it's a real shame if the government doesn't come together and uh, bring back the country together. Um, Berger, the, the question here is about what uh, effect foreign donations may have on the rate of inflation. Is there a risk of inflation uh, with, sure. you know, we're talking about not just private contributions, but uh, well, massive amounts of aid coming in uh, uh, to the, uh, the damaged Nepal economy. What's the experience been in other places, and is that a serious concern for Nepal? Well, one of the things that we saw in the Philippines, um, you know, was around the, the, just the prices that some of the foreign nonprofit organizations were willing to pay for things way beyond the cost that any local um, people or organizations could pay, be just because they came in with sort of deeper pocket pockets and um, um, sort of a readiness to just pay whatever they needed to, to sort of get the job done, um, which inflated material costs mm -hmm. tremendously um, to for rebuilding, um, and uh, I think from from that perspective, I think that's um, you know that you know that I think that's fairly common uh, with with disaster response um, and with large aid organizations coming in. It sort of disrupts the economy a bit. Um, um, so that's something to sort of watch. Um, it's, again, it's a good reason, I think, to, to try to also support the local organizations that are responding. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I also think that they're, you know, going back to the discussion of livelihood and some of the topics that were raised about uh, around, um, around uh, 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 Sort of the ge the gender issues and many of the the, the sort of the, the 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 men being out of the country during the disaster. I think that we are, you know, there there was a similar uh, uh, scenario with the Tohoku disaster in Japan, where there were there was a large youth migration out of out of that area, and then when the disaster struck, a lot of people wanted to come back um, to help rebuild and to help 
develop um, the area that had been affected. And I, I wonder whether or not we might see some of that with Nepal, given that there, we, we are hearing reports of people coming back from overseas to kind of help rebuild the family home and, and, and do, some, do, some other, um, do some other work. And uh, you know, I, I, for people who may want to stay uh, in Nepal, you know, I, I think that there might also be, in terms of economic impact, some opportunity to help create opportunity for people to stay there with their families now that they're coming back from the disaster. That's, I mean, that's, that's some, one of the similarities that, w that we see in terms of um, sort of that region um, and, and, and some of these reports about, about a return into the, into the country. I think the, I think the difference uh, between Japan and Nepal is that the uh, large number of these migrant laborers who work in the Middle East, mm -hmm. they're the sole breadwinner, so there's no way they're going to come back and live in Nepal. They're right. just coming back if they right. can to, if they can afford to meet the families. But, right. um, but there are a significant number of uh, people who uh, live in the States, uh, live overseas, who have regular jobs that are going back, and th you know, I, don't, I don't think they'll go and live over there. Uh, but as far as migrant workers go, uh, you know, they are stuck where they are and um, they just send remittances as much as they can. Yeah. yeah. Um, Elizabeth, uh, there was a, a piece in the New York Times last week about uh, the sanitation issues and problems and challenges in Nepal and been a major push by the government and international aid agencies to uh, improve sanitary facilities, build toilets at the village level, community level. Uh, obviously, you know, m many of those facilities are now destroyed or wiped out. Um, what are the prospects and, and you know, what's the experience uh, the, uh, of your organization in terms of that particular aspect, rec recognizing that the risks of cholera outbreaks, of, uh, you know, uh, disease from poor sanitation are a huge problem short term, but also longer term uh, in terms of of improving the health and sanitation in, in rural communities in Nepal. Yeah, of course that should be, the water and sanitation should be an essential part of, of rebuilding a home or a school or whatever. Uh, Build Change has less experience than other organizations in, in how, to, how, how to actually get that done. Um, but it, it's, it's an absolutely essential part of it. But it needs to, again, be done in a way that is locally appropriate, using locally te available technology based on homeowners' preferences. Again, kind of going back to my experience on the Fulbright in India, when the NGOs came in and, and kind of made their own, dis their own decisions and and basically decided for the homeowner where the toilet was going to be, um, in this case, put it inside the house when people wanted it outside, then they didn't use it. And so that's no, and they maybe bash a hole in the wall to put, a, put something in that they want, and so they're comp compromising the integrity of the building also. So again, if we're getting the architecture wrong, whether it's a window or whether it's where the toilet is, people are not going to engage in what we're, what we're saying about building safely. And so all of these things are connected together. And we certainly don't want to put people in a situation where they don't have a functional toilet that is culturally appropriate. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it all, it, it, it's, it's all part of the, the challenge and, and we have to deal with a holistic solution here. Uh, Norbu, we're in a bit of a race against time with the monsoon season approaching. Um, and, uh, y you know, you've, you've been there recently. You know, what's your sense of the window during which, you know, some uh, reasonable accommodations in terms of shelter can be put in place? And what are the risks in terms of mudslides and uh, that sort of thing uh, as we now get into the rainy season? Well, the monsoons are, um, if anybody has experienced the monsoons, it's, uh, you know, the downpour of rain is absolutely nonstop. And you have to remember, Nepal is a very mountainous area. Um, and the outbreak of things like cholera and those diseases are going to be more prevalent uh, in the lower hills. But up in the mountains where it gets very, very cold, uh, there are tarps right now that people are using. Kids are back in school inside tents. Uh, so people are going to have to figure things out really, really quickly. And there are lots of um, various groups uh, in Nepal right now, um, engineers, uh, 
um, that are trying to figure out short-term and sort of long-term sensible solutions um, uh, for the villages. Um, so, yeah, time is not on their side. I mean, uh, and uh, landslides are prevalent uh, in Nepal, especially in the monsoons, because of the huge amount of deforestation that has taken place in the country, and um, you know those riverbeds tend to rise, and flooding affects not just Nepal and India, but goes all the way into Bangladesh. So. Um, yeah, monsoons are literally around the corner, um, just about, you know, end of May, early June. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, this window is very short right now, so. Um, the final question is uh, from someone that is interested in a kind of the balance between what is the, the in-country capacity to recover and rebuild versus the help that's needed from outside. Uh, we've talked about an overall you know, possible price tag of $10 billion. Uh, your, uh, is it the quake meter or what is the, the uh, that says we've raised 500 million yeah. so far, so there's a, a ways to go. Um, but w would you like to comment or any of our panelists on, you know, how do you uh, strike this appropriate balance between the, the, the right kind of assistance from outside while at the same time drawing upon the resources and the capabilities and the resilience of, of Nepali, the Nepali people and Nepali organizations and institutions. Well, Nepal has always been a country which has been abundant, there's been a massive, uh, an abundance of NGOs over there. So a lot of the um, economy is supported by aid from outside. So there's no lack of expertise. There's no lack of social organizations that can do a lot of good. Um, so as far as striking a balance, I think uh, the uh, local people who can implement, who can build, uh, you know, should really be allowed to do the job. And our responsibility from the outside is to make sure those funds are available to uh, ensure these things are put in place. Berger, anything you'd like to add on that? I think that's exactly right. I think there's a, a very strong NGO, local NGO capacity in, in Nepal, um, but they need the, the resources and the funds to do the, do the work, and I think um, I think that should be a, sort of a key focus. Yeah. And Elizabeth, I think we're going to give you the last word. Uh, uh, you have just a, a moment or two, and then we're going to need to wrap up. I would repeat cash plus technical assistance, that that's what's needed rather than, you know, when we get into the re recovery phase, past the relief phase, giving knowledge and incentive-based cash rather than going and just building a house for someone. I, I think from what I'm hearing and understanding from our engineers on the ground in Nepal, there is a lot of capacity, um, a lot of opportunity to build more capacity. And all the programs build changes run in our China program, we had one foreigner and everyone else was Chinese. Indonesia program the same way. Haiti, we had a little heavier expat involvement, but I think, I think, I think the opportunity here is, is, to, is to pass on knowledge and information and use that as a way of, of driving change and stimulating change and, and supporting local organizations, whether they're Nepali NGOs or in our case, it's gonna be a lot of work with the Nepali government as well, so. Great, mm -hmm. well I think that is uh, about all the time that we have, so I would like to ask our audience to join me in thanking our expert panel, Elizabeth Hausler, Berger Stomperdahl, and Norbu Tenzing for their excellent uh, and insightful comments and the discussion. And I also want to thank you, the audience, for joining us here tonight. Thank you so much.